He was a man They say he was simple He took less Than a day At a time You could see In his eyes Just what he lived for Hey trappers <laughs> You ever notice when you look like this and you're walking along the road and you're carrying your dispatch rifle that everybody stops and stares at you. <laughs> Especially when they see my car along the road with nobody in it and they see me out in the swamp. Everybody slows down and they're like looking out there. What's that lunatic doing? <laughs> I'm just harvesting, just harvesting. Well, I'm definitely getting the hang of using this stake puller for my cables. I find that just laying this down with the hook side down, hooking, hooking it into my cable or even just my quick link, and then I just give a good tug. That's pretty easy. Not too bad. Yeah, so I just have the loop of the cable around the tip of this hook. I'm going to hold the camera and do this, but if I get this closer, and then I just pull up. too bad not too hard I mean I used to dig these out so um, that was a lot easier than digging them out I will mention though when I'm using this stake puller my Wolfgang anchors are coming out pretty nice and flat but I at one point before I had another shipment of these I ran out and I had these other cheapy ones and look at that that sucker just bent so I would say uh, you know these are more disposable, that's for sure. But if you can retrieve your Wolfgang, Wolf Fangs, Wolfgang, he's a chef. No, not Wolfgang, <laughs> Wolf Fang. Um, yeah, then you can keep them working for you. Also, anchor pulling time is when you really appreciate drags. Probably about half of my sets were drags. And those are so great because you just pick up your drag and your trap and go. I'm using this No BS uh, anchor puller. It's working great for the cables. I just hook this hook onto the cables and pull them out. But before I knew I was gonna own this, I didn't know to make my cable ends a little bit bigger so they fit on the hook. So some of them were a little bit too small. That means this loop here didn't fit on the hook that well. So what I did was I just started, you know, looping into the chain and pulling the anchor out that way. And what I found out twice so far is where the weak point is. <laughs> so here's one of my old cubbies. And the weak point is the quick link. So two of these quick links popped on me. I don't know. I just find that kind of interesting because if that was a real big bobcat or a real big coyote or something, I wonder about the quick link. So I'm going to be testing these a little bit better as we go along. Make sure that, ooh, get that in focus. Make sure these don't pop now. Was this all the way tight? I'm not sure, um, but I'll be doing some tests to double check that. One thing about the flagging setups like this is that they're uh, definitely flagging humans too. <laughs> So people that are out hiking and stuff, they, you know, get very curious and go, what the heck is that? So you might want to only use these in an area where you know that, you know, there's not a lot of public. But this one worked out really good here. And it even, I caught that big female coyote in this set right in front of this flagpole. So that coyote wasn't even nervous from this. But I would expect that most are. Uh, I had some questions on my fleshing beam, so I'm just going to show you real quick. It's just super simple, and I'm no carpenter, okay? <laughs> but I did buy the beam uh, at the New York State Trapping Convention up in Herkimer in August. Uh, there's all kinds of vendors, and I just found an outdoor vendor who I bought actually all my stretching boards and this from. He's just a woodworker. 
I uh, don't know if he has an official business or is just a side hobby. But anyways, um, Chappie was saying, you know, if I was going to be doing a lot of coyotes, I might want a wider one. So this is kind of like my all-purpose flushing board, and it worked fine. I like it. It's mine. <laughs> and uh, what I did was I just mounted it to some plywood, so I'll show you that. And then uh, I made these notches with some boards on the back to stand it up, and I made it for my height, you know, so it fits right into my hip. And then when I don't want to use it, I can just take the board out and flatten it down and lean it up against the wall and uh, it doesn't take up any space so it's sort of like traveling board. I'll have a little angle on the top here so this fits. Let's see if you can see that good. Yeah, fits right into the notch here and then the other notch down on the bottom. So that's all it is. Uh, pretty simple and uh, very efficient. See, it fits right here at my hip so I can work, you know, right there. Here is that coyote that Chappie helped me put up. I'm so happy about that. Um, it's a it's a huge coyote. <laughs> so I put it in my furnace room <laughs> down in my house and it's perfect now. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip this. So first I'm just gonna take the pins out. I'm just gonna take this bolt out which spreads the board out. There. So now the board is collapsing, so I can pull the hide right off, loosen it up a little bit. It comes right off. Now we have to turn this inside out to get the fur. Oops, pin the tail in there. So I found the easiest way. I mean, you could go either way, but what I do so far with all my fox is I just stuff the head down in. What I was mentioning to Chappie that I saw and I heard on Chapline Radio is there's a company now making stretchers that dry from the inside, kind of like a fan system. I'll have to look that up on the internet. That's for the uh, guys catching lots of coyotes. And so you don't have to flip them. Just put them on with the fur on the outside and the inside is gonna dry. So I'm just gonna grab the nose inside here. coyote right side out I don't know but it's kind of rewarding with the uh, furs that have that fur on the outside when you're showing up to the buyers I know you know like otter and raccoon you have the skin out it's just not as pretty all right so we're just gonna shake this out fluff the hair out a little bit amazing that's pretty full hair Chappie said the color's a little off it's a little red but uh, now I'm gonna put this back on the board with the fur out you know what's cool to me is working with such a big fur <laughs> like Chappie was saying this is like the big game trapper animal the biggest one we have in the east here and when you're handling a bunch of little furs like raccoons and fox, it's kind of cool to handle something this huge. So I want to get her centered. Then I'm going to just straighten out the legs and repin them. Well, there it is. I put up my first coyote and uh, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm sure there's some mistakes here, um, but it seems to me like pretty good fur and guard hairs I can you know get my hand in there not completely lost but uh I don't care uh this one is probably going to be tanned for me uh since it was my first one I put up any coyotes that I caught before this I sold directly to taxidermy right on the carcass so um yeah I'm happy uh, I'm gonna let it dry on the board for probably about a week and then pull the board out and hang it like the rest of these furs. It's a beautiful Sunday morning out in the beaver swamp. I realized that you can either go to your, you know, health or community center or gym and do Tai Chi, or you can go walk in a swamp. <laughs> 
because you definitely have to have your balance. Oh my gosh. When you're walking in, you know, three feet of water, you never know what you're going to step into or where you're going to slide off to. So, yeah, it's good for you. Let me show you what I'm doing here. Well, I had that 330 in this swamp here, right underneath these logs here, and the beaver have been going around it, but the muskrat did not. <laughs> so we got him. We got him by the tail and the hind leg. So not really trapping muskrats, but glad to have a catch and I will skin and put them up. Well, I can't seem to keep the raccoons out of my beaver traps. Here's another one, I mean, that was an underwater trap, but raccoons love the water. It's where they find a lot of food. So have to let this guy go. Well, I'm not catching a lot of fur here at the end of the season, but I sure am having a blast because, yeah, first of all, as you know, just being out in nature is number one reward. Um, also kind of going to places where no other humans sort of go on a regular basis, like, you know, who wants to walk around in a swamp except for a trapper or maybe a duck hunter or something. And check this out this crossover log back here where i've been showing you the raccoons and stuff crossing over holy cow check out this cat this is a huge bobcat who says cats don't like water <laughs> it's amazing what the camera's catching um i can't see it because on my phone it's a little small right now but i think we got a muskrat too going across there and we have these beautiful wood ducks swimming through and so Hey, you know what we're not catching in the traps we're catching on the cameras and that's fun too well i hope you like the wildlife caught on cameras as much as i do that was pretty cool hey at this point i'm gonna step back a couple weeks in time and go up to vermont to see my parents uh lucky enough an old friend of mine robert who's also a viewer of trapline talk uh took me out ice fishing so i brought my beaver tail along to try that out so if you're all done watching and you don't want to see ice fishing, hey, remember Trapper Snore, sustainable, natural, organic, and renewable resource. But if you want to go ice fishing in a beautiful spot, hang in there and uh, enjoy. Well, we're out on Glen Lake ice fishing. I'll just pan around, but a little bit of snow falling, and it's pretty awesome. Robert's telling me a lot of stories, and we're watching fish on the flasher, but we're not getting any bites. <laughs> So he has the uh, wax worm and I have the beaver tail and we'll just see. Uh, ice fishing with Robert Harvey. <laughs> there he is. Good morning. <laughs> so tripped off all the traps and came to Vermont to see my parents for president's birthday weekend. And Robert and I have been talking a lot on uh, messaging. So uh, I was able to catch him out here and his ice fishing. What are we gonna fish for? Uh, there are crappie and rainbow trout and big yellow perch. Awesome. So he knows how to do it, but I did bring a beaver tail <laughs> just in case we can see if it helps. That's a fish right there. Wow. See it? Yep. So on this side of the screen, uh, it's the whole 31 foot water column. So that's the surface. That's the bottom, that wide red band. Wow. This side is zoomed. Yeah. And so that's uh, 12 feet, or I can make it six feet. That's six feet. So that's the bottom. That's the, uh, well, th this is the six feet of the bottom. And well, there was a fish right there. There still is. Right? Wow. That's so cool. Uh, so we're using a little tiny tungsten jig with a wax worm on it. All right. And so I drop it in the hole and you watch the, the right hand side of the flasher. The little green flashes you see are, that's like zooplankton. Yeah. Okay, right there, you see that up near the top on the right, like at yeah. one, one o'clock, you see yep. a little red line? Yeah. That's my jig. Oh, wow. And you were saying this is an older technology? It's, this is like, Flashers are like 1960s fish finder technology. And why do you like it? 
it works really good for ice fishing. And now that's my jig. Now that it hit the bottom 12 feet, you can see it on the uh, uh -huh. like about 11 o'clock on yeah. the left hand side. That's the zoomed side. Oh. So now you you can see it falling. Yeah. And so that that's like a foot off the bottom right now. And so you move your jig as little as you want you you'll see it move on the flasher so what happens is when you actually see a fish uh, there's a fish there now see how the uh, it got, he's, he's the, right at your the, yeah you see how the band got wider yeah so the the transducer sends down sound waves and the sound waves are in a cone and so when a fish enters the edge of the cone it it first shows up as green or um, this is a three color it's it's set up to run three colors right. so lower density objects are green and as they get more in the center of the cone directly in line if they're if they're larger they show up as red oh i got so you so when a fish is like right directly underneath you it's it's red and how do you you pick this spot that we're in just out of uh uh, experience yeah we've done pretty well here for quite a number of years well, not so much in the last year or two so flashers were like the original depth finder fish finder technology and then they kind of went away but in the last maybe 10 years or so or maybe more than that they've made a resurgence with ice fishermen is this the first one you ever had or did you get a, a different one I have five of them <laughs> I have Two of the exact same thing, and then three that are lower models. And do you have five? Because sometimes you're using more than one at once. Yeah, um, I have five because I accumulate stuff and never get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> when you run multiple units, they they interfere with one another. Oh. But there's. Okay. The top button where it says gain, you can push that and it's it has different levels of interference. Uh, it changes, I think it changes the frequency so that the um, they don't interfere with one another. Gotcha. But, it, but the more of them you have out, the more complicated it gets. Can you, can you tell the size of the fish? Not really. No. Only only that it's you know like really small fish won't show up red right you'll just see green right that's um, how you you said the plankton yeah and also bait fish the, yeah but even smell when they're right straight under you which aren't aren't very big they'll be red what bait fish are in here is they all wives or not all wives no. just just um we have emerald shiners and um I think they're called silver shiners that people used to call hunts that people uh -huh. used ice fishing. This is already a bad start. Usually, usually you see fish, more fish than this. Mm. What's really cool at night when there's a lot of crappie around is there'll be, you'll have like 15 feet worth of crappie on the screen. Wow. And and they 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 pretty much stay stationary underneath there, and. It's, it's the crappie are really can be really finicky and you can drop your jig through them and so you can see your jig falling past the fish yeah and as soon as you get one that starts to follow your jig down you can reverse it and and slowly start moving it up yeah if you can get a if you can get a fish to follow it up like that they'll almost always bite <laughs> excuse me wow <laughs> it's, it's really it's, that's pretty cool when you first get a flasher and you look at the thing, it's just a bunch of flashing lights and it's kind of nonsensical. Yeah. But after you've used them for a while, stuff starts to make sense. Yeah. I mean, I'm already yeah. seeing the motion of my yeah. jig and I see the bottom and I'm trying to find fish, but I didn't see any fish no, yet. No, they'll be obvious. You'll see. We will we'll eventually. Now, the first flashers I had didn't have zoom. So you were looking at like like it looks on the well, oh, on so the right you, side. Yeah, actually, yeah. I can I can. So this there's no zoom right now. So this is the surface. This is the entire 32 feet. That's the bottom. Yeah. Right. Um. It might be easier if I change the. 
Okay. So right now it's on the 40 foot range. So the whole dial is 40 feet. The bottom is right here. That's 32 feet. And yep. our jigs are right there. But there's yep. no zoomed section. Oh, gotcha. So you can still see pretty good because right. it's it's the whole thing is larger. Yeah. That's an auto setting, so it automatically changes the range. Uh huh. And then um, that's a six foot zoom. So this is just the bottom six feet. Wow. Which is which is which is good unless like crappie sometimes will come in higher. Yeah. Record, which came from here. It's like whoa. I, th I think it's twenty nine pounds, something like. Oh that. my gosh. And. Over right. the years, he caught a number of fish that were like in the mid twenties, but he but he never did break the record, and he passed away last winter. Oh my gosh! But he, but he fished in the same spot for more than fifty years. <laughs> he was a legend. Twenty nine pound northern. Yeah. Jeez. Do you ever um? What's the the deepest lake up north there? Willoughby. Willoughby? Yeah. Do you ever fish there? No. Is it because it's deep? Is there any more, like, success cause, or more fish in there? or? It's They have fish in there that they don't have everywhere. Like, yeah. Um, they have burbot, oh. which I'd really like to go fish. That's a freshwater cod. Uh-huh. And, and I've never caught one. I'd kind of like to go there sometime and fish for burbot. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, That's like... Eight or nine hundred feet deep, right? I don't, I don't really know, but when you look at the pictures on the, of the, like the yeah. mountains come down like this, yeah, and the lake is really narrow and long, and judging by the way the mountains come down, it, it's it's very very deep. Yeah. I've been on it on my snowmobile, and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I want to ride on here. <laughs> picturesque they yeah. fish for lake trout there a lot and and burbot at night and yeah they must have smelt but so what i do when there's a fish is i mostly am watch, trying to watch my rod tip because it's diff really difficult to feel fish bite yes. but yeah. you can see it oh uh, i see all right so robert and i are here fishing in vermont <laughs> He's fishing the heck out of me, although we're not doing too great. <laughs> Better than yesterday, though. Yeah, yesterday was a blanco. But we're using these flashers. And Robert has a fish. It's just you leave him. Close to his. Oh, it looks like I might, too. Yeah, you do. I did. And they bite so softly that you just barely see your pole move. I'm just learning this. And I guess I missed one. But anyways, it's been fun. Robert's like the consummate outdoorsman uh, when we were kids. So I went, So he had a sign outside his house that said trout flies. And I saw that. And I was getting into fly fishing. So I knocked on his door or gave him a call or whatever and he brought me upstairs in the house and then I was tying flies then too. I had taken a class from like an Orvis thing and I was just terrible at it. And then I watched him tie flies and I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> like he was really good at it. So then he says, so what do you want and where are you going fishing? And next thing I knew, he's coming fishing with me. <laughs> I'm like, don't you have flies to tie? <laughs> nope. So we went down to Otter Creek and... We had woolly worms, I remember, and like I guess there were like tent caterpillars, and they were dropping out of the trees or something. But that we was were like in Southern Rutland, right? Yep. Yeah. And we dropped woolly worms right in the you know it was basically like flat water right before the ripples, and the brown trout were just they would just come up and pop up and grab them, and <laughs> and we were catching like fifteen, sixteen ounce browns, uh, inch browns, and that was really fun so later we did a little bit of uh not too much but we went out uh i think we went out crow hunting in a boat once we did yep lester yep. river yeah we got checked by wardens there too that that's time. true yep and we made sure that we were crow hunting because yep. that was about the only thing in it season was about the only thing, yeah. <laughs> and then we uh 
we went ice fishing on this you said it was marsh pond old marsh pond and um we we caught these northern pike that uh we could barely get through the hole and that was my first experience with that and i was like oh this is awesome <laughs> so the next week my uncle came up from new jersey and I took him out there and we didn't get one bite <laughs> that's, that's actually like just over the hill from here it's, it's really close to here so anyways, Robert was telling me about trapping. He trapped in West Rutland where we grew up as a kid, like nine or ten years old, right? I started when I was like nine or ten, yeah. Yeah, catching muskrats. And what did you do with them then? Uh, well, we we skin them and stretch them. And, and um, there was a fur buyer that would, would travel, would stop at our house and, and see what we had to sell. Every nice. Day. Yeah, and you back then you said there were there, uh, a lot at, of fur buyers. Yeah, and at, at one time back then, muskrats were worth like like twelve nine, bucks, ten, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's amazing. They were worth a lot. So um, he was just telling me that there's even a store today down in Maryland that that they buy muskrat from trappers. Yeah, they buy muskrats whole, and and I assume they sell the skins, but mostly because they sell the meats. They sell the meat and. Uh, that's interesting. So they can commercialize wild caught. They can, yeah. At least, at least muskrats and raccoons, they come there. Yeah. Huh. And there's actually people who come in and buy muskrat and raccoon meat. There, there are uh, towns that have like they'll have muskrat dinners. Wow. Like you'd have a you know <laughs> spaghetti dinner here. There's, yep. there's places that have muskrat dinners there, and there's mm. restaurants that serve muskrat too. Wow, that's pretty cool. You know the essentially the vegetable eating fur bearers are are good are yeah, good eating. Yeah, well, yeah. Beaver, <laughs> no, beaver is definitely beaver, very good. Yep, we just made beaver stroganoff at my club for a game dinner, and it was absolutely delicious. And I, I don't know if you've watched any of my previous videos, I made some beaver stew at home with some of my beaver. Lately, I mean, I just started trapping beaver, so the the first that fifty five pounder I got, I. I cut all that meat up for uh, predator bait for next year. Um, I saved the quarters for my fisher traps. Yeah, it's because so. it's oily, it works good for fishers. It doesn't yep. freeze or something. Yeah, yeah it has a good aroma. Yeah. For uh, It didn't work for me this year. But, I mean, actually, I, I think, you know, if it gets too warm out and the meat kind of goes bad, then, you know, I pretty much should yeah. change it out. But, um so anyways, Robert's, uh, he's caught a few. Let's see if I can get him on the camera here. Whoops. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We got a yellow perch, a couple yellow perch and a crappie. Black crappie. Yep. That's his favorite fish to catch, I hear. In the summer or the winter. Both, yeah. 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 So it's been a nice trip to Vermont, but we're going uh, back to uh, Hudson Valley today, and uh, I'll reset the traps and uh, keep you all posted. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. You're welcome. Beaver trapping. I should put runners on them. Use them in Maryland. Put out decoys. Oh yeah. <laughs> 